This is Things Police See, First Hand Accounts, with your host, Steve Gold. Hey guys, it's Steve. Thank you for checking us out. Uh, this is episode number 28, and today on the podcast, I have a, a first time for the podcast. I have a co-host with me, good friend of mine, Ken Roybel. He's a retired L.A. PD police officer and background investigator, and he also currently runs policebackgrounds.net for all your background investigation needs. Ken, thank you for coming on. Ah, oh, thank you. This is exciting. I've been thinking about this for <laughs> for a few days. It's very exciting to be here. I'm excited to have you, man. Today we have uh, today we have a commander, my friend. I think it's the highest rank ever to come on the podcast. Wow, that's cool. Commanders are cool. Yes, Commander from Colorado. I think Commander is that's not an that's not a Northeast thing. We don't. I don't remember any agency having a Commander, but I think it's between somewhere between Deputy and Lieutenant or Deputy and Captain. Is that right? Uh, for most departments, like Commander is uh, uh, between Captain and Deputy Chief. Um, but some agencies have commanders as they, they did away with the captain ranks, like some of the smaller California Orange County agencies. They now oh. go from lieutenant to commander. Is that like a pay raise with no position move? That's pretty sweet. Uh, yeah, but I mean, it's still real, realistically, it's still a captain. So. Gotcha. This guy, um, this guy has quite the resume. I mean, checking him out, he's... He was in the army. He was a police officer. He retired a commander. Um, he's an adjunct professor. He's authored a book. And he's also a personal coach. So um, very, he's a go-getter, I'd say, for sure. Yeah, he's got quite a bit going on. He's got quite the resume. Makes me look like, uh, you know, I got my resume from Kmart. But he's uh, he's pretty incredible as far as uh, all the things that he's done. This is going to be a great interview. But Ken, does he have the stories? He's got to have stories. <laughs> he was there for 23 years, right? And so he made his way up through the ranks. And now he goes around um, uh, helping other police officers to be the best police officers they can. And there's a lot that he has going on and from one uh, one area, uh, like police stress to leadership. So he's got it all going on. Excellent. All right, brother. Should I Should I dial him in? Let's dial him in. All right, this is going to be a live dial and also never done this before, so. Very cool. Looks pretty easy. Just added him. All right. Hello. Patrick. Hey, how's it going, man? Hey, thank you for coming on the podcast, my brother. Uh, I appreciate it, brother. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. And you're uh, with us is a good buddy of mine, Ken Roybel, retired LAPD. Ken, nice to meet you, brother. Hey, how are you today? I am doing fantastic. How are you? Good deal. It's great to be here with you. I appreciate it. Thank you. We were just uh, we were just doing a little intro and kind of going over your <laughs> credentials. Very impressive, my man. I mean, we're looking <laughs> at from the Army to police officer to uh, you retired as a commander in Louisville, uh, Colorado. You're an adjunct professor. You've authored a book. You're a personal coach. You host a podcast. So <laughs> you've de- you're uh, you're definitely a, a hard charger, I'd say. Yeah, I appreciate it. I mean, I, I had a great career in law enforcement, 23 years, retired as a op commander here in uh, Louisville, Colorado. I mean, uh, it's not a big agency, about 35, but uh, had a great career. And uh, yeah, I, I want to continue to give back and started the show and wrote a book and love the brave men and women who serve us every day. I love it, man. That's awesome. And I noticed it's Louisville, not Louisville. Yeah, don't say uh, Louisville. <laughs> <laughs> I'm off to the wrong start already. All right, so I already said that, so I'm in the doghouse for that. No, no, no. It's it's a common uh, mistake, and but yeah, it's Louisville, Colorado. It's it's just outside of Boulder, Colorado, if you're familiar with the area, and uh, about uh, maybe 40, 35 minutes, 40, 40 minutes north of uh, Denver. How what's big? The size of the, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was going to ask, what's the size of the department? Uh, about we were. I retired. Uh, I think we were about 36, 37. You know, oh, so cool. it's a, it's a smaller agency. I mean, it's nestled in between. Uh, Boulder, well, if you're familiar with the area, Boulder, Colorado, Broomfield, and, and Lafayette. But it's a good it's a good department. It was a great time. Good. Seems like any agency over 20, 25 guys has, is big enough to have um, the cool specialties and some some areas you can get into, you know? Yeah, we, you know, we had uh, options, you know, for our officers. You know, they, they we had a, a SWAT assignment. Uh, it was a Boulder County kind of collaboration. They can get into the SWAT. They can get into, you know, DRE stuff. Um, you know, skill resource officer, not a lot of options like, you know, LAPD or bigger agencies, but we did have some options 
you know, for, for officers to, to get into. So it's a, and it's a pretty cool town and, you know, the, we got a lot of, uh, support, you know, they love the cops here in Louisville, which is great. That's awesome. Yeah. I like that. I listened to, um, I was listening to one of your podcasts. Um, I think your latest one and you, uh, you wanted to get that straight, um, put that out there that, you know, cops, uh, you know, the media kind of portrays it one way, but, uh, you see a lot of support from the community and I've actually, I had guests say that before. It's good to hear. Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, you know, you know, we tend to hear the, the, the minority group or, you know, fraction of the population, uh, that kind of is vocal. I'm not talking about, you know, minority groups. I'm just talking about, there's a very small amount of people that are the most vocal. And, um, you know, I, I really do think the vast majority of people, <clears throat> do support law enforcement, our first responders. I just, I always say, I just wish they were more vocal about it. Well, Ken is a minority, so we have him here to kind of chime in on all nice. that stuff. Nice. I'll, I'll be, the, I'll be the resident minority for any <laughs> questions. Um, you know, I, I did want to ask Patrick a question since we're on yeah. this subject. Yeah. Um, Patrick, and, and, uh, I noticed that, um, one of your, uh, interviews you were talking about, or actually on your, on your website, you're talking about the, how policing looks uh, look different from the 23 years that you were in from the beginning to the end. And I saw the same thing. And I'm wondering what's your, uh, what would you say to people who bash the police and say police departments are inherently racist? You know, I would say, you know, educate yourself. I mean, I, I think don't just go along with people in the media or talking heads uh, that are saying one thing. I, I think we're in a society right now, Ken, uh, and Stephen, where people just watch a YouTube video or they hear it from their friends and they say, well, I guess that's I guess that's how it is. Educate yourself. The vast majority of police officers who interact with citizens every day in this great country doesn't result in a use of force, doesn't result in a shooting. Uh, you know, so I, I would just say educate yourself. Go ride along with a cop. You know, most departments let people ride along. Join a citizens academy. I mean, there's so many things you can do out there the average citizens to develop your own opinion. I just think that a lot of times people out there just run to a conclusion without knowing all the facts. Are there bad cops out there? Absolutely. But you can't tell me the vast, I'm not saying you guys, but people can't convince me that the vast majority of cops out there are racist. Nobody gets up every morning and says, you know, I'm going to go shoot somebody. I'm going to risk everything. I'm going to put everything on the line, my house, my family, my wife, my spouse, whoever, to go shoot somebody or beat somebody up. It just doesn't happen that way. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I was uh, going to mention that I, I, I agree with you. Uh, the vast majority of police aren't racist. I think they prejudge people based yeah. on your experiences. If you if you worked in a high gang area um, where the, the gang members uh, were a certain color and they drove certain cars and they dressed a certain way and they were constantly on reports for robbing and, and all those type of things, those are the people you're going to prejudge when you see them on the street. But that doesn't mean you're racist. I mean, that's that's the perception. I, I, yeah, and I just think that we, again, I mean, I, I think, I think I'll, most people out there are just good people, but I think there are a percentage of people out there that just – take the first thing they see on YouTube or an Instagram feed or whatever. And they say, well, I guess it must be it. And I always use the analogy. You guys have probably heard this. I mean, think of the NFL, think of a, a catch, you know, wide receiver, you know, foot in, foot out. How many angles do you see on TV? You, you, police don't get that luxury. So don't judge right away what you see. Sometimes it's cut and dry. A lot of times it isn't just wait until you get all the facts and then come to your own conclusion. Hmm. Yeah, that's um I think that all the time when I see newspaper headlines and we know from experience that it, it later will be all hashed out and that's not the fact. But you see it and you're like, just take a minute to do some yeah. journalism <laughs> before you Well and that's the problem, that man. It's is that we, we just live in a society today where it, there's just people that are so quickly they just want to judge so quickly. And it's like, let's just take a minute and get all the facts. And if the officer's in the wrong, the officer's gonna be in the wrong, there'll be penalties for that. But I mean, come on, just don't rush to judgment right away. Absolutely. Patrick, are you ready to answer some questions? Go ahead. All right. Shoot. Can, you, can you tell us about the uh, first time you responded to a hot call, what that was like? Oh, geez. Uh, first time I responded to a hot call, you know, I was a brand new police officer in southeastern Colorado. I didn't spend my whole career in one department, but I remember it was an active domestic violence call. Um, I was one of three officers responding and I believe that there was a knife involved and the feelings that are going through your head, 
um, the thoughts are, you know, at least I was thinking, you know, first of all, get there safely, but it's an, an adrenaline dump. And then you're, you know, all these thoughts are racing in your head, you know, it's just multitasking, getting there safely, getting on scene, and then trying to sort things out. Luckily we, you know, we, we diffuse the situation, made an arrest, but I'll never forget that call. I was scared to death. You know, I'm here. I am a brand new cop. I was a couple of days off FTO my training and I get the first call of the night, the hot call, of course. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was a scary experience for me, but you know, you got to go in there with confidence. You got to go in there with, you know, I'm going to fall back on my training and, um, you know, obviously, obviously officer safety and officer, you know, safety for the people around you. But, uh, I was scared, but we got through it and it was, uh, uh, it ended up, uh, peaceful, which was good. Mm. Yeah, that's so. There's always that added pressure too when you're when you're new and it's your call oh, yeah. and yeah. everybody's well, watching at you and you're, you want to. <laughs> you know, you're like you got the sergeant there or the watch commander and you're like, oh my god, I screwed up. But that's part of it, you know. You're gonna make mistakes and hopefully they're not huge mistakes, but you're gonna you're gonna make some mistakes and that's what uh, you know. That's what the senior officers are there for to hope hopefully guide you and mentor you. And I had some great great officers I looked up to, you know, as a, as a young police officer that really kind of. Uh, helped me along the way. Did you, um, on that first call, cause I remember this myself, uh, something that caught me off guard was, um, my heart was racing. And then I, when I tried to talk in the radio, I, I kind of yeah. realized like, Ooh, I gotta like, yeah. I gotta calm myself down. Cause yeah, you, I remember oh, you know, it, was brutal. Th- it was an interesting thing. You said that because afterwards, after the call was done and everything and it settled down, you know, maybe two or three hours later, I got a call from one of the dispatchers and they said, Hey man, you okay? And I was like, yeah, and they said you were kind of amped up on the radio, <laughs> yeah. so just got to take it easy. You just got to slow it down a little bit. So yeah, I remember that. So that was that was part of it. But that's all part of the you know that first dump, you know that first experience. I mean, you get to you know be a veteran. You know, you're like, okay, all right, I'm in round. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's kind of it's kind of tough still because I think you deal in this as well, Patrick. Where where people don't seem to realize that in a in a matter of seconds, your adrenaline pump just goes yeah. through the roof. And then you're like that for a few minutes and all of a sudden you're supposed to just take it down and you do that over and over again over, over the over. course of a career. And it messes with your stress and your heart. And oh, your, it's just, exactly. Everything. I mean, that's just the, one of the inherent, you know, dangers of, of police work. And, you know, like I said, you're right over time. I mean, it's, uh, you know, two things happen, you know, over time, I think some of the times we become desensitized to, you know, the calls that are coming out. I know I did. Uh, where it's like, okay, like I said, I just, I just said, all right, you get now, you know, years later, you get that call and you're like, all right, I'm in a round, you know, and, but that's experience. That's, you know, it, it comes with time, but I agree with you hundred percent. I mean that, you know, up and down, up and down, up and down. It, it just wreaks havoc on your sleep, your body, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. There used to be a, a years ago, there was a statistic and I, I haven't updated it, but the statistic was that the Average American male lived to be 70 and a half years old, and the average American male police officer lived to be 55 and a half. Oh, yeah, it doesn't surprise me. It doesn't surprise me. Hopefully, we've gotten better with those stats. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. That's brutal. I remember in a police academy, the, uh, we had this old trooper teach a class, and he said, I'm going to show you why you're going to die younger than everyone else. And he, he went to the chalkboard, and he drew like a normal person's adrenaline spikes, and he was like, uh, almost got in a car accident. Six months later, went on a roller coaster, but it was fun. And then he, you know, it shows like two, three bumps throughout the year. And then it shows, uh, let me show me, I'll show you yours of the typical police officers. And it just is like, boom, 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 up and down, up and down. Yeah. And he's like, you're basically just coring your heart out with, uh, you know, with adrenaline dumps. Yeah. And I always thought, you know, the fire guys have it great, you know. I mean, they they, they go out, you know, they, get, they go and they, they get their hot calls and they're busy too. But then they have that downtime, you know, and police are always – you know, obviously it's just a different game. I mean, it's, you know, we're all out on patrol, patrolling all the time. Our, our you know, our situation uh, awareness is always a hundred percent or it should be. And, you know, at least fire guy, you know, the fire department, they get those breaks, you know, at least I thought, you know, so it was like, Hey man, I want to go in there and play video games. Yeah. They got, <laughs> they got four walls and a roof. They can, you know, they're safe. They can take a nap. Now much love and respect for the fire guys that are going to, or women that are, that are listening. So hey, it's nice. Yeah. It's not their fault they're smarter than us. Yeah, exactly. Now, one thing you mentioned earlier when you were talking about that domestic violence call is that uh, people don't realize that uh, police work is scary. And, you know, cops get scared when they have to go around that corner, that alley in the dark. And um, it can be a very, uh, it can be traumatic for, for officers over the course of time. And you, uh, you uh, 
uh, counsel officers when you talk to them? And what do you say to people that want to be police officers? Because I deal in police backgrounds. And what would you say to a new officer who's who kind of has their their eyes, uh, you know, their head in the clouds and think it's all Hollywood fun and like that? Well, do your research. I mean, really, I go on ride alongs, like I said before, for, for citizens. Do your research. Research the departments you want to get hired on. I mean, I, I know as a new officer or, or people that are thinking about it, you know, they kind of get this myopic view of it. But that's that's probably the best advice is go on ride alongs, talk to officers, befriend officers, you know, do as much research, research the department that you want to work for. I mean, every department's a little different. Culture is different. Um, so I, I think, you know, like I said, it comes down to really know what you're getting into. I'll never forget this story. This was happened when I was still on the job. And um, I had one of the sergeants come to me and say, hey, Commander, uh, you know, one of the uh, our new officers just got off FTO. She she wants to quit. And I, t- I said, well, you know, what have you talked to her? And he said, yeah. And I said, we'll send her in here. I want to talk to her. And so uh, I talked to her and said, you know, what's going on? And she said, I just I just didn't realize it was going to be this way. And I was like, well, OK, I mean, I'll support you, whatever you want to do. But and then she ended up resigning. She just just couldn't do it. But I, it goes back to that point. I mean, know what you're getting into. You know, I mean, Hollywood is Hollywood. You guys know that. I mean, it's just movies. It's a it's not an accurate portrayal and description of what law enforcement do every day. We're not running, gunning 100 percent of the time. Most of it's at least in my experience, it's it's community policing. It's talking with people. It's mediating. It's all that stuff. So education, I would tell people, know what you're getting into. Yeah, that's interesting. That's funny too. And people look at Hollywood and it's like, actually, it's a lot less exciting than that, but you'll be a lot more scared. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. What is yeah. What's the old saying? And so it's 80% of boredom, 10 or 20% of, you know, you know what to the wall and, you know, hair on fire and stuff like that. So yeah, it's funny you watch these TV shows, and within an hour they've gotten like three shootings, and they've uh, you know gotten fights, and then they go and they never write any reports. They no. just go out and have fun. And <laughs> it's awesome. Just, they wrap up everything, and they even go to trial in an hour. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I don't so know, I don't so know efficient. Where these kids are getting these ideas. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's Hollywood. It's you know, it's uh, and you guys probably heard of it. It's a uh, uh, it's a CSI effect. It's kind of the same thing. You know, you go to court and. And you guys know this. I mean, people watch like these all these. I can't remember how many CSI shows. I don't watch them, but they want to see in courtroom what happens when it comes to evidence and stuff like that. I mean, it's a CSI effect. So, and the problem is a lot of jurors. You know, what I can't remember a third of or a half of shows out there are police related, which is fine. But a lot of people look at that and say, "Well, this is what I expect from law enforcement. This is what I expect in a courtroom because I see it on TV." Sometimes yeah. it's true. Some, a lot of times it isn't. And Steve and I have joked about this stuff before. Where people watch TV and then stuff happens and you read about in the news and they come up to you because you're the you're the resident cop and they go, well, "How come they didn't shoot him in the leg? Oh, uh, <laughs> how, yes. how come they didn't throw the baton and trip him as he was falling?" Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, said, I, I got I got to go. <laughs> yeah, I did, yeah, I had that discussion and you know with because I teach you know and and not so much the police cadets but you know the college students they, we get into those discussions and you guys know they're like. How come the cop doesn't shoot him in the leg? And I said, well, you know, on a range, in a static situation, you know, I mean, it, I would challenge cops. I mean, even best shots to, to to make that leg shot. I mean, they probably can if you're you know, a good shot. But now have a moving target, somebody moving around, flailing, running. It, it's just it, it's not real. <laughs> yeah. And the problem is that people sincerely ask that question. Yeah. Well, it's Hollywood, you know, like you, like you said, I mean, it, they see it on the shows and they see it on the movies where somebody, you know, shoots a knife out of their you know, person's hand. And I always tell people, well, <laughs> what's the bigger target? Torso? Yes. Or is it the, the mass. wrist or your, or your arm? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, come on. It just it just doesn't happen. And police officers are not trained that way. And hopefully we never will be trained, uh, you know, to, to shoot for a hand or something. Or there's a lot of people are going to get hurt. The best thing that doesn't get enough uh, play on the news is when they they take the, like the uh, the reporter and they put him in the simulations traffic stops and all that oh, yeah. and he just shoots everyone he shoots a driver yeah, he the passenger he goes ah, ah. he goes well it was terrifying yeah, yeah, people I didn't know where their hands were I didn't know what they were gonna do yeah, yeah. it's like man they yeah, should play that day. all the time that's yeah, every day with law enforcement and you know our brave men and women you know out there every day patrolling our streets keeping our communities safe um, 
you know, like I said, it, it's it's frustrating to hear the criticism, and and some of it, some of it is warranted, but I think the overwhelming majority isn't. Yeah, I would challenge anybody out there listening. You know, go go right along, go right along with LAPD or, or a big city or even a small municipality, and see what these officers are dealing with on a on a daily basis. I know when I left, our call loads were going up twenty five percent. We're getting busier. Officers are leaving the profession. It's hard to get ranks replenished because people don't want to be officers. Not all people, but some. You guys know. I mean, when I when I became a cop years ago, I remember you'd have a couple positions. You get hundreds of people showing up. Mm-hmm. We're not seeing that. I was in charge of recruiting for a while in my agency, and we did pretty well for the most part. But still, everybody's vying, everybody's jockeying for the same people. I imagine it's like that in California and any state. Yeah, it is. I spoke with several background investigators from different agencies, and everybody's in the same boat. Even yeah. I read an article uh, all the way to New York where um, recruitment's down by huge, a huge, huge percentage, and nobody uh, is applying. And to be quite honest with you, a lot of times Steve and I saw, uh, or the time we worked at Backgrounds, is that the and a lot of people that are applying should not be no. applying to be police officers. No. And I've thought you guys have probably heard, I mean, I've, I've heard of stories where, I mean, it didn't happen in my agency, but law enforcement agencies, some are actually lowering their standards. Hey, I'd rather work short on the street than have some idiot that shouldn't be there on the force. And, but some agencies are resorting to that. And, you know, obviously I don't agree with it, but it's hard, you know, it's, you know, and you're talking about, I was talking to a friend of mine uh, back East in a big, huge city. I won't name it, but it's down like 800 cops. You know, wow. I mean, it's, it's yes. crazy. I mean, it's crazy. Patrick, can you describe to us your strangest or most bizarre call? <laughs> I'm waiting for this one. <laughs> uh, I remember it was Halloween. This was probably about, I don't know, 10 years ago. And uh, it, things had settled down. It was a busy night, and I'm driving down the road, and I see this figure in the median of the road. And it's, you know, two or three o'clock in the morning. And I'm like, what the hell is that? And I, you know, I'm a pretty good distance away. And I slowed down and I, it, it had this weird form to it. And I was like, what the hell is that? And I'm hitting my spotlight. And as I pull up closer, it's, it's a person in a Gumby suit. You remember Gumby? <laughs> oh, yeah. Gumby? <laughs> remember Gumby? And he's, uh, he's, he's in the Gumby suit and he's got this, remember his head is all kind of distorted and stuff like that. <laughs> it's like this big, huge foam, foam outfit. And I pull up and I'm like, this guy's like, st- he can't, he, he can't figure out how to get off the median. <laughs> and, and so I pull up and I'm like, Hey Excellent. man, what's going on? And he's, you know, drunk as hell. And I'm like, Oh my God. I'm like, what are you, what are you doing? And, and, He's like, oh, yeah, yeah. And so <laughs> I'm like, well, you know, I, you know, the agencies do it differently, but we, you know, we could take them to detox or something like that. And I said, Hey, all right, do you, do you have anybody, you know, that, that I, I can shoot you home really quick? I, you know, I mean, I said, I'll just bring you home as, as long as there's somebody who's an adult and they're responsible and they're not a tax get I'll just go ahead and bring you home. He's like, all right. You know? And so I get this, I'm trying to stuff this guy <laughs> into <laughs> my back of my patrol car and I'm like, dude, can you do me a favor? You know, can you, can you, can you take off the suit? I can't, I cannot fit you into this car. I mean, it's a big, huge phone suit. And you know, he's like, all right, you know, I'll take it out. Well, he's naked underneath. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> he's naked underneath. That makes and it I'm, difficult. So that was, I finally get this guy home, but that, I, that's the first thing that popped into my head mostly because it was just, you know, it was, was Halloween was not too far ago, but that was for, I'm sure I could come up with many, many more examples, but that was one of the strangest that, you know, that popped into my head. And you know, of course, you know, it was just me. There wasn't any other cops there. And, you know, I, <laughs> I, and they, you know, they didn't believe it. And they're like, what the hell are you talking about? I was like, I'm, I'm serious. You know, and this was before we got dash cams in the car and stuff like that. So it was, I got to tell you, if it was you and I, and we're working patrol and it was 2019, I would have had you take a picture of me with Gumby. Oh, I would have. <laughs> I, yeah, I didn't that. have a cell phone at the time, but uh, that was probably, was probably one of the, the funniest things and things that really stuck out to me. Um, <laughs> but that was hilarious. I never forget it. I was like, well, why don't we take off your Gumby suit? And I, you know, figuring the guy would have shorts on or something. No, he's buck naked. <laughs> wow. The funny things drunk people do. <laughs> 
God. Now, did he did he take the suit half down or did he actually get naked and get no in the back? he completely he, could, he took it completely off because you know it's, <laughs> you, it's you know it, it's like a big huge bulky suit and they, you know how small those back seats are in the squad cars and I'm like oh, yeah. just take the thing off well, he's naked and it's like <laughs> it's like twenty degrees out or something I'm like did you I don't know think about putting some clothes on today maybe some underwear maybe a t shirt or something oh no man uh, the Gumby <laughs> suit. That's great. Did you get to witness who you dropped him off to? Uh, receive? Yes, him? I did. I, he, his uh, his roommate, nice guy, and he's like, "Oh yeah, he was out partying." <laughs> and this is normal oh, really? for him. <laughs> really? Yeah, it's just normal behavior. Yeah. <laughs> great, man. That's awesome. All right, Patrick, can you tell us about your most intense or uh, terrifying call that you responded to? <laughs> um. Yeah, I remember we had a uh, when I was on a tactical team, we had a uh, big meth house. We were. Uh, busting out in the county and uh, i remember uh i was one of the point guys coming in first man second man in not the point uh, second man in and i remember everybody's kind of peeling off and it's the dark house it's out in the country and i go straight and i shine my light up and there's this woman uh sitting there uh cross-legged with a blanket um right in front of me, maybe 10 feet in front of me. And she's got her hands underneath this blanket. And, uh, you know, I, I kept on yelling at her, kept on telling her to show me her hands and she was tweaked out. You could tell, uh, but she was also pregnant. Uh, I could tell that she was pregnant and, um, but she wouldn't, wouldn't show me her hands. And, um, uh, it, it was tense there for a minute because I knew she was pregnant and I knew if she came up with a weapon, things were going to go wrong. And uh, I was able to finally convince her to show me her hands very slowly. She did. And she had a 38 that was in her lap. Mm. Uh, we finally got her up. So that was, <laughs> for me, that was like a, a pucker factor. So uh, that's one situation that I'll, I'll never forget. And, of course, you know, it's she's pregnant, you know, and she's, you know, doing, sure, maybe some of you have seen it before. Um, you know, she's in this meth house. And I was like, my God, I, if I have to shoot this woman, I mean, it, it, it's going to be tough, you know? Oof, yeah. So, yeah, but she could have pulled the gun out and pointed it at you, and you exactly. could have shot her, and you would have been at fault. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, this was a while ago, but, um, yeah, I mean, it was, it, was a, it was a situation that I'm glad um, was resolved the way it was, obviously. But, you know, it's those things, again, like we talked about, uh, that – you know, officers deal with uh, every day. I mean, this is not a unique situation that I just mentioned. Then you know that, um, and Stephen, you know that. I mean, these are situations that officers face every day. That uh, over time, you keep doing that over time and time and time. It really affects officers, first responders. Mm. And when you stacked up, were you uh, on the tack team or were you uh, uniform patrol? No, I was on a tack team. Oh, okay. Tack. So uh, this was a call they were trying to negotiate people to come out and stuff. So we finally made entry. Oh, that's got to be freaky after they, they've already tried. It's not like a no-knock warrant or anything. It's like no, no. They, they're not wanting to come out. Hmm. But we knew other people were inside. and It wasn't like a barricaded suspect or something. So Very, very intense. Um, Patrick, can you, can you warm us up a little bit with a, with a heartwarming moment from your career? You know, so many. I mean, I, I love, I, you know, I, you know, just, I, I know it's a cliche, but just giving back and helping people. I always liked being involved with uh, the Christmas drives and things like that, where we're helping um, less fortunate people in the community. And, and you know, towards the latter part of my career, I was actively involved in, uh, you know, shop of the cop and work. It's different wherever you're at, but we, um, my last year on the job, we actually used a, an old Sam's club and we made it into like, we had a lot of donations for, for Christmas, and we actually had uh, people that couldn't afford Christmas for their families. We actually set up aisles and stuff like that, and we actually had it make it look like an actual store. And we kind of oh, that's cool. Up, yeah. set off an area where you know people it it was free, and people could come in, and that was a very you know satisfying thing that we could uh, you know give back. And you know, it's see, it's a, it's an excellent opportunity for for people you know, to see a different side of officers and there's not a, no agenda behind that, but we just, you know, we want to give back. We want to help out our less fortunate in our community, but it's a great opportunity for people to really talk with officers. And, you know, I think we changed some minds, you know, when we did that where, 
people are showing up saying, you know, man, I thought you guys were you know, a bunch of, you know, idiots and, you know, out to get me and stuff. And you guys really made my, you know, kids Christmas special. So that's a good feeling. I wish they would do more uh, stories about that, especially during the holidays when uh, sometimes they'll do where these um, LAPD used to do this thing where the motor cops used to stop people and they would give them coupons or something like that. And, or they would take, they would fill their trunks of their patrol cars with, um, with food baskets for turkey dinner and things. And the, you don't see a lot of that on the news, um, but the, it goes on all over the United States all the time. You just don't hear about it. Yeah, I mean, it's the news. I mean, it's occasionally you will, but they, they report the bad. That's their business. And uh, but yeah, I, it, but, you know, I wouldn't, you know, rely on news media. You know, I mean, if you're out there listening and you see cops doing this, these great acts of kindness, record it and post it on social. It doesn't have to come from the media all the time. I mean, post it on Instagram, post it on LinkedIn, whatever, Facebook, get it out there. So people are seeing I'm talking about regular citizens. You know that that want to support officers. I mean, that's a great way. Don't rely on the media to do it for you. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I I'm friends with probably a third of the people, or maybe a quarter of the people on my Facebook thing are police officers or in law enforcement. And like Ken was saying, like you don't see it at all uh, in the news, but I see it all over my feed when yeah. the holidays come. So it's like it's it's really nice. It's really amazing. Yeah, and like I said, it goes back to where I, I said before. I mean, I, I think the overwhelming of a majority of people out there support law enforcement. I think the next thing I'm going to do, and I haven't, I don't know why I haven't thought of it before. It just occurred to me, but next time I see a cop or cops in a restaurant, I'm going to go ahead and pay for, for their meal and uh, just thank them for their service. But um, uh, that's something I've been thinking a, a lot about lately is how do we thank our police officers when you see them in person? Most people won't go up and say anything, but I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to pay for their meal. I don't care how many of them are there. That's a great yeah, idea. That's awesome. Yeah, it's a great idea, and, and they are appreciated. But, you know, a, a lot of times, you know, it's like military personnel. Every time I see when I travel and I see a brave man or woman in, in uniform, I always go up to them and, and just shake their hand and thank them mm -hmm. for their service. And that, yeah. is, that is the world to them. You know, same as same as first responders, you know, I mean, I, I think it's incredibly great, gracious to buy them dinner. And I've done that before, too. But I think sometimes it's just a simple act of just going up to them and say, you know what? Thank you for your service. And they that that is huge with with mm -hmm. most cops. I mean, because they don't hear that all the time. They, they hear it very little, especially when you're in uniform, because you're right. A lot of people are afraid to approach an officer, male or female, because of that. Whatever. I mean, they're just in uniform. That's a authority figure in. But, you know, most officers, I can't speak for uh, all officers, are going to be very, very receptive for that, to that. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where, um, you know, when, you, when a, a police officer hears that, it's a really big deal. People think, oh, it's, it's no big deal because I just told them, you know, w w we appreciate what they do. But in reality, police officers, whenever you make contact with a citizen, whether it's a suspect or a victim, those are negative contacts because – on both scenarios, they're going through something that is a negative contact with the police, whether you're taking a report because somebody just, you know, robbed them at gunpoint or you're arresting them because they did a bad thing. So when a police officer rarely hears a thank you and when somebody comes up and says the smallest little thing like we appreciate you, that's huge right. to a police officer. Yeah. It used to make my day no matter how bad my day was. And if somebody didn't happen all the time, but if somebody came up and said, you know what? Thank you for your service. That would have been like, oh, my God, you know, it really is worth all the crap that officers go through because it just takes that one person to come, at least for me, and change the outcome or change my perception of the day because then I'm like, oh, at least this person is thanking me for my service. And it really is a game changer for a lot of – it can change the day for a lot of officers out there. Mm -hmm. Patrick, do you have um... – do you have some advice for new police officers? And just for this question, assume that they, they know what they're getting into. <laughs> yeah, I would just say, well, I would just say, you know, you got to listen. You know, I listen, you know, I think, you know, God, whoever you believe in a higher power, he gave us two word, or two ears and one mouth for a reason. Listen twice as much as you talk. So listen, listen to the senior officers. Listen to um, you know, the people that are, that are doing it, that have been doing it a long time. Seek out the right officers. I, what do I mean by that? I'm talking about any department has the, the cops that, you know, 
that, that are that are not I hate to say it, but they're they're toxic. And you, you want to stay away from those cops. You want wait. They're dead weight, man. They're rods, retired on duty or whatever you want to call them. They, <laughs> they're you know, they they don't want to be there. And it is an imperative that you seek out mentorship and coaching from the right officers. Align yourself with those cops. They're going to help you grow. They're going to mentor you. They're going to teach you. So that would be my advice, you know, and uh, every department has them. It's any, any, you know, they, they have the people that are, that are toxic and, um, FTOs. This is where I was always big on FTOs. I want the right people in those positions. We need to have the right people in those positions. I don't want some, some person in there, some cop who's pissed off better. And I'm not saying you're going to have bad days. I'm not saying that we we don't live in a bubble, but I want FTOs that are pumping, motivating and inspiring the young officers. We don't need people in there that are just going to complain all the time. No. Um, so seek out the right officers, you know, seek out the people that are going to, you know, help you and mentor you. Yeah, that's solid advice for sure. Mm -hmm. Patrick, you, um, like I was saying before, you have quite the, uh, quite the hustle going on. And I really appreciate it because I love to see guys going after it when they're done with their police career. Cause most guys retire being cops at, and they're still relatively yeah. speaking young guys, you know, you can have a whole nother career. Um, you and Ken are actually a lot like that way. Ken's doing a side business with, um, police backgrounds.net and you're doing uh, you got the podcast and you also have, um, you do personal coaching. Can you talk about that? Well, yeah, I, I started personal coaching a while ago, you know, and I want to help, you know, law enforcement officers, other first responders who are, you know, overwhelmed with personal and professional obstacles to build self-confidence, resiliency, so they can help, you know, so they can become stronger and more happier in their lives. And we all deal with stuff. We all have baggage, you know, especially first responders. Um, but I want to help officers and uh, I've had a lot of success with it. And, and I, I just enjoy helping people. I want to continue to give back uh, to a career that was so good to me over the years. And yeah, I, I just love helping the, the men and women who protect us every day. I think that's a that's a good thing that you're doing because um, for years, police suicides have been uh, a big deal. And now it seems like they're in the news all the time where Chicago and New York has been having a rash of police suicides and, and all over the country. And I think that your type of... Um, your type of service and counseling for for officers would give them that boost they need to see life in a in a much different uh, way. Yeah. And it's so important, you know, that officers reel out. There. I mean, they just I, I know it's hard. You know, it goes back to what we were talking about about the media and, and what you hear and social media and stuff. You know, you, you can't just <laughs> it's you, you just have to develop that right mindset. And again, I'm, I, I know it sounds simplistic, but you have to realize that there's so many people out there that care about you, that cherish, that love you. And I'm talking to first responders right now. Uh, and you know, I'm, I'm not a P you know, I'm not some, sh I'm not a psychologist or anything like that, but um, you have to realize that there's a lot of options out there. There's a lot of help. You can talk to people, you know, there, there's so many resources out there. If you're suffering, you just, you just have to, you have to reach out. And a lot of officers, I, you, you both know this, is a lot of officers think that it is a sign of weakness to, to reach out and ask for help or, you know, I need a coach or I need some help. And no, no, brother and sister, that it's a sign of strength that you're doing that. Mm -hmm. You got to get rid of that mm -hmm. mindset that, oh, I'm weak if I ask for help. Everybody needs help at some point. Everybody does. Absolutely. Get help before it's before you go too far down that, that rabbit hole. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And is that what your, uh, your book Evolve, is that what that's about is it kind of like a mindset book for success or is it specifically geared, geared towards um overcoming problems i you know, i apologize this, this, I, I would have read it but we we set this up pretty quickly oh no 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 so it's a small micro book and i and i wrote that for a reason it's an easily digestible read you know you can do it in one sitting it's only about 70 pages but yes it's you know it's it's mindset it's you know some tips and habits and routines that i've learned in my career in law enforcement not all of them but you know the 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 more important ones, I believe. And, and you know, advice and tips and, and, and uh, suggestions that I've got by having so, some of the best and brightest on my show. But yeah, it, it's it's motivational, it's inspirational, and it, it'll help you. And your show, your podcast is um, CJ Evolution, correct? Correct. Uh, I started the show about uh, three and a half years ago when I was still on the job. And I was a, I'm a big podcast junkie. I listen to all kinds of podcasts. And I remember I was listening one day and I was like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to try that. You know, I mean, and, uh, you know, learned how to do all the editing and all that stuff. And 
Yeah, it's been going strong. I'm up to about 340 episodes now, so I'm, I'm pretty happy. Wow, that's awesome. It's available iTunes, Stitcher, anywhere you can get podcasts, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio. Uh, it's, it's, you can find it in a lot of places. Awesome. And where else can people, uh, if someone wants to get a hold of you or get your services, where can they reach you? The best way, brother, is uh, cjevolution.com. Um, you know, I, you can get, reach me on Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, but it's all right there uh, on the website, cjevolution.com. Awesome, man. And Patrick, Patrick also authors for one of my favorite uh, law enforcement websites, Law Enforcement Today. Oh, really? And, uh, yeah, that's like one of my favorite websites. Yeah, I had uh, yeah, just a great you know publication. I mean, online publication. It's, it's the biggest, I believe, in the world law enforcement publication, online publication. And I uh, became friends with Kyle Reyes, who's the national spokesman for law enforcement today. Uh, a couple of years ago, he's been on my show a couple of times, and uh, he reached out to me about a year ago and said, "Hey, man, would you be interested in contributing to the to the publication?" I was like, "Absolutely." And I've been fortunate and blessed enough to to write a handful of articles. But yeah. Yeah, and your your article, Steve, you would have you would have got a kick out of this about two three years ago because uh, uh, Patrick uh, uh, Steve has a YouTube channel. It's called Ghouls Gaining Gaining Ground, and one of them was was his last day on patrol in Massachusetts. And Steve, the article that Patrick wrote is titled "Leaving the Force Can Be Challenging." Here's how to start <laughs> steering yourself in the right direction. <laughs> Where were you, Patrick? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, it, the reality is, is, is that we're all going to get out of law enforcement. I tell cops this and people all the time, cadets. I was like, you know, you know, I'm a cadet. You're young, but you know, you are one call away. I hate to sound bleak. You guys know this. You're one call away from, God forbid, some sort of injury or something like that. That's going to force you to do something else. So, what are you going to do? What's your plan B? What's your C or D? I believe in versatility. You have to be versatile, uh, especially in this job. And I learned that a long time ago when I was younger, and I knew that one day my law enforcement career would end. And okay, now what? You know, what am I going to do? And I'm blessed and fortunate to be, you know, doing what I'm doing. But you just have to have that versatility. You have to have a plan, man, and, and start now. Absolutely, like your, um, like you said in the podcast episode of yours, I listened to the. Uh, I used to hear this all the time. Cops were like, I do this because uh, I, I ain't got no skills. I got nothing. This is all oh, I can do. All yeah, I can yeah, do is know, learn I, law. Are you kidding? Are you kidding? And, and, and no, I hear that too, man. I hear that too, Ben. And it's like, you are. don't pigeonhole yourself into thinking you have You have unbelievable skill sets. Absolutely. You continue to give back to the world. Don't, don't let people – don't let people – convince you or get in your head. I remember when I was real quick, I remember when I was retired, I had good friends of mine that I've known for years. Some of them came up to me and said, what are you, what are you going to do? You, you've been a cop for a long time. I was like, what do you mean? I'm going to, I'm going to, going through that door and I'm going to do other great things, <laughs> but you can't, I, I have it all written down, you know? So, but you're right. So many, so many brave men and women think that, well, this is the only thing I can do. And, and you know, I'll, I, Guess I'll do something law enforcement related, or, or and that's fine. I'm not saying that, but you you have so many talents, so many gifts. You know, so really, really start tapping into those, man. Write it down if you have to. I talk about this in the book. What are your goals? What are your habits? Put them down on paper. Write them down. You know, start tapping into that. Absolutely. I get I get emails sometimes from people, and they're kind of asking like, they're teetering. You know, they're close to retirement, they want to retire early and they're like, but what could I do? And, um, they know that I've been an investigator, a couple of different hats, a uh, background investigator. And now I'm a, I'm an insurance investigator. I tell them that all the time. I'm like, you got the skill sets, man. And if, if you just get a couple good recommendations, they're going to know that you are a cop. You manage your time on your own. You dealt with people by yourself. You investigated, you, yeah. um, you know, you thought on your feet in high pressure situations. Most employers find police officers to be very, very good employees. Exactly. They're disciplined. They understand, you know, rank structure. I'm not talking about if you go to the private sector, maybe, maybe you have that, but they're disciplined. They're under, they understand how to take orders. They understand how to follow through. It's just, I, I hear that a lot and it just kind of gets to me sometimes. And you just can't let the, the those naysayers, because there's always going to be naysayers. Once you accept that, once you accept the fact that people are going to criticize you, no matter what you do, there's a sense of peace to that. At least there was for me. Because I know when you put yourself out there, and you put your name out there and you create a brand and you're start, you know, doing stuff, people are going to be like, what's that guy doing? He's crazy. But a lot of times, whether you're a cop or not, it's that insecure. It's their own insecurities that are coming out and they're trying to portray on you 
you know, uh, you know, and, and these are good people, but they're in, some of them are insecure and, and they have fears and they see you doing it or crushing it and, you know, that they're going to criticize, but it doesn't make them bad people. It's just that, you know, some of them are just insecure and, and they see you doing it and so they want to criticize you. Sure. Maybe they well, thought of it, but they were too afraid to try. Exactly. You know, and a, you lot of, it, man. a lot of people, they, they, you know, if you come up to you and go, what do I, what am I supposed to do? What am I qualified to do? And, and I'd say, haven't you been hanging out with you for the last like 50 something years? Yeah. You don't know. I said, go talk to Patrick. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and that's what I would tell people. I said, well, what do you want to do? You know, uh, you know, people say, well, you know what people tell me all the time or, you know, I'm in a rut. OK, what does that rut look like? Well, I want to I want to break out of this rut. OK, well, what's causing you to be in the rut? And then you start get to the root of it. Well, you start digging deeper. OK, well, you know, I I'm you know, I'm stressed about money. OK, what can you do to to alle alleviate that stress? You know, I mean, people tell me that a lot. They say, well, I'm just in the rut and I, I just need to get out of this funk. OK. All I can, it's up to you. I can give you the tools to help you do that, but you got to dig deeper in your, I mean, you know, people out there that are listening right now, if you're in a rut, first of all, I'm sorry, but you know, the reason why you're in a rut, you, you know, you just got to do some soul searching and it's hard sometimes it might be, it's embarrassing, but if you want to truly get out of that and grow and learn and go towards success, you have to, you have to do some soul searching. And that's what I help people with. Absolutely. That's awesome, man. That's, um, I mean, I was in a rut myself with, uh, we all, I was too. We all go through them. Yeah. I, with this podcast, I, I did it for, uh, six months. I had a bunch of great guests and, um, it became harder to book guests. And I was like, oh man, reaching out to people is challenging. And the podcast just sat there. And as it sat there, the listenership kept getting bigger and bigger. And I was like, man, people are just like listening to every episode. And I was getting emails and emails and like, it didn't matter. Like I was in that rut I was reading them being like, ah, it's going to be too difficult. But then I decided to really go for it. And then, you know, three weeks later or a month later, I have uh, Patrick Fitzgibbons on my yeah. podcast. So yeah, there you go. And it's an honor to be here, brother. And here's the thing really quick. I mean, there, here's the thing that a lot of people don't realize is the more successful you get, you know, and, and the more recognition you get, the less competition there is really, because most people stay in the middle. Most people settle for mediocre, right? And the, the game is on the fringes right here. That's where the game is played. And a lot of people just settle for that middle. And then a lot of people, once you kind of stray and you start doing things and you becoming better and you becoming successful and you giving back, a lot of people want to pull you back into the herd and say, no, man, hey, Ben, you got to come back here. Yeah. And a lot of people succumb to that. A lot of people do. But what people don't realize is, you know, it's, it's, there's not a lot of competition when you start re reaching those top layers. Look at Tom Brady, whether you like him or hate him, he's one of the best quarterbacks ever. Absolutely. How many quarterbacks are, how many quarterbacks are in the NFL? I mean, there's how many team, 30 something teams. What quarterbacks are you always hearing about? Tom Brady, you know, I mean, Aaron, you know, uh, Aaron Rodgers, all these top rated quarterbacks because they play at a different level. And that's what people have to realize. You have that ability. You can play at that level. But a lot of people settle for mediocre and then they regret towards the end of their life. Don't do that. I like hey, it. Steve. He's getting me pumped. Steve, what I'm gonna <laughs> this is what I'm gonna do. I just decided this right now. I'm gonna print out a picture of Patrick. I'm gonna paste it on my wall. <laughs> and every morning I'm gonna look at the picture and I'm gonna go, You're good enough, you're smart enough. Patrick thinks you're the best. Yeah, and I'm, go, I'm telling you, man. I mean it, it's He's good. You know, we just we just need to, you know, you need to surround yourself with people that are, that are pumping you up. You know, I know it's hard, um, but you need to, what Jim Rohn said here, the average of the five people you surround yourself with. And it's so true. And it's hard for law enforcement. I know I've been there, you know, where you, you have these good friends, you, you've been together for a long time. You're, you know, your, your, your team members and things like that. But I know from my experience, a lot of those people were toxic and I, it's not that I don't love them, care for them, but I started, okay not hanging out with them all the time. I started getting friends outside of law enforcement uh, and that made all the difference in the world. Again, this is not a dig on law enforcement. I love the brave men and women who serve us, but law enforcement is an inherently toxic environment. People don't call us when things are great. They call us when, you know what, hits the fan. And a lot of times the toxicity comes into a department. That's yeah, what I was telling. That's what I was saying, you know, with new officers, seek out the people that are going to inspire you, motivate you. I'm not saying you, there aren't bad days, but you know as well as I do, the people that are constantly draining you of your energy that are toxic. Just get away from those people, man. 
Yeah, what I've told people for years is there is life outside law enforcement. Exactly. It's, you know, there's other things to do, other people to hang out exactly. with. Exactly. And, you know, we are conditioned, at least I was, uh, you know, in law enforcement, you know, from a very young age, you know, it's us against them. You know, it's that mentality. And I'm not saying, you know, you don't keep your up your officer safety. You're not cognizant of your surroundings. I'm not saying that. The only thing I'm saying is that you can take off your cop hat once in a while and actually meet people who are outside of law enforcement. And who the hell knows? You might even enjoy it. And <laughs> mm -hmm. that was that was really pivotal for me because I was one of those guys who, are, you know, if you don't have a star or a badge, I'm not going to talk to you. You're one of them. <laughs> and then I started to change my mindset, mainly through my wife. And she was like, why don't we go out? Why don't we meet new people? She's a realtor, so she knows everybody. And I started, you know, becoming friends with her friends. And I was like, wow, this is great. You know, I mean, these are actually good people. They're not criminals. They're not people who want something from me. We'll just go out and have a good time. So mm -hmm. for law enforcement, you know, listening to this, I mean, if, if you have friends outside of law enforcement, great. If not, I would encourage you to do so. You know, you got to have that balance, man. It's, it's that small percentage of people that we deal with. The majority of the population is not like that. Absolutely. Patrick, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, man. It's been, it's been an awesome time. Yeah, awesome. Absolute pleasure and honor. Uh, I appreciate you having me on. And uh, anything I could do to help uh, with your show, please let me know, brother. Oh, I'm going to go through your list of guests and start po <laughs> poaching away. <laughs> yeah, you let me know, man. I, I'd love to, to help you with some of your, some guests and, yeah, anything I could do. But it's been a, a truly an honor, and I appreciate the opportunity. Awesome. Thank I think you. I speak for Steve and I. We are fans. Absolutely. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. All right. Take care. Hey, guys. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Patrick Fitzgibbons. He's got a lot going on. He's a hell of a guy. I had a good time interviewing him. Um, don't forget to go over to his website and check out everything he's got to offer. It's www.cjevolution.com. From there, you can get his micro book, you can link to his podcast, and you can contact him for all your personal coaching needs. So go check out Patrick over there. And I would like to request that you go to iTunes and rate and review my podcast. That would be fantastic. It helps the show in its standings. Just give it a, a five star if, if that's how you feel about it. And I hope you do. Um, and write a little comment or just give it the stars and you don't have to write a comment. But uh, anything you can do is greatly appreciated. Um, that's a that's a good free way you can show uh, your support for the podcast. If you want to contact me, you can reach me at steve at thingspolicey.com. Now that's a new email. This is my legit big boy pants email. The other email, the Gmail is still, I'm still monitoring it. I'll still get email there, but uh, I'm trying to transition to steve at thingspolicey.com. So uh, send any your questions there, any guest suggestions, send them over there. I appreciate all that stuff. And I just appreciate the um, all the emails and Facebook messages and Instagram comments I've been getting. It's, uh, it's really cool. I love interacting with you guys. Uh, if you want to join the Facebook community, go over to the Things Police See Firsthand Accounts Facebook page, and I'll try to... Um, post stuff there. Maybe if we talk about something in the show, I can post a link there and you can check it out. One last thing. I said the wrong episode number at the beginning of this. Um, it's actually episode number 29. So sorry about that. I, I'm getting confused sometimes because I'm, I'm trying to do my due diligence and get these interviews done beforehand, get them edited and get them um, in the queue to be published. So uh, because of that, uh, I'm easily confused and sometimes I screw up the number, but this was episode number 29. Thanks guys. I'll see you next time.